Let me read to you a passage from the 10th chapter of St. John's Gospel, verse 22 to 30. It's the Gospel for Tuesday after the fourth Sunday of Easter. St. John writes, Then came the Feast of Dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple area, walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. That's from John chapter 10 verses 22 to 30. It speaks of faith. Imagine this case. She was one of three, the youngest. Her family was but moderately educated. She reached junior secondary level in her formal education. She was intelligent though, and manifested this good intelligence in her everyday life, and in the sense of responsibility that she brought to the fulfillment of her duties. She was a good horse rider, with a very good sense of humour, a toughness which could become stubbornness, and a plain, prosaic approach to things. The notable thing about her, and in which she quietly surpassed her older brother and sister, and probably her parents too, was the religious faith of which she seemed possessed since her earliest years. She always believed her Catholic faith, accepting it with ease and embracing with a simple genuineness its highest mysteries, such as the Incarnation, the Blessed Trinity, the Redemption, the Holy Eucharist, the Divine Foundation of the Church, the call to union with Jesus Christ. The Catechism shaped and reflected her faith. She naturally prayed, she took steps that involved difficulty to get to regular Mass because she loved the Mass and knew that the Catholic faith contained the revelation of God. Further, for all of her long life she never faltered in her faith and in its practice. She died at an advanced age in the love of Jesus Christ. The point about her case is that she did not reason to belief from a state without it. She always seemed to have it. It was there, her faith, and it ever grew. In a word, she was one of Christ's sheep and recognised his voice, following wherever he called and led. It seemed that it was precisely because she belonged to him that she recognised his voice and his teaching as being true. Her faith was not precisely a conclusion, it was a given. This given disposition was of one who belonged to him who is the Good Shepherd. It was a gift which she was found to possess and by which she lived faithfully. She lived her faith, but her faith was not precisely the product of her own clear thinking, even though she did think clearly about it. Light seemed to have been granted her, and she was faithful to that light not neglecting nor squandering it, let alone allowing it to die within her. For this reason she was blessed by God, but at the same time she was judged meritorious and indeed remarkable for her life of faith. My sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. This same lady had a slightly younger contemporary who lived in a different country and who had an entirely different educational upbringing. In fact, 
he had outstanding educational opportunities, due to which he excelled academically. I refer to <coughs> Anthony Gerard Newton Flew, who lived from 1923 to 2010. Flew became an eminent British philosopher, belonging to the analytic and evidentialist schools of thought. He was the son of a Methodist minister and embraced atheism as a teenager. As a matter of fact, he was well known for his works on the philosophy of religion. As opposed to the but moderately educated lady I have described, Flew began with the assumption that one should presuppose atheism until empirical evidence of a god comes to light. In his various publications, he criticised the idea of life after death, a free will defence in dealing with the problem of evil, and the very meaningfulness of the concept of God. It was manifest that he began with suspicion in relation to the being of a God, let alone in respect to the possibility and fact of divine revelation. He was an atheist and spent his impressive intellectual career defending that forlorn position. However, at the age of 81, he declared himself to be a deist, accepting the God of Aristotle's works, in keeping with his lifelong commitment to go wherever the evidence leads. To the follower of Jesus Christ, including the aforementioned lady, if she had ever heard of Flew and his newly acquired theism, his religious position would have seemed a disappointment. He later stated that he was quite happy to believe in an inoffensive, inactive God, and he denied that there was any truth to the rumours of 2001 and 2003 that he had converted to Christianity. I want to be dead, and when I'm dead, that's the end to it, he apparently told the Sunday Times of London. I don't want an unending life, I don't want anything without end. Such was the crowning finale of Anthony Flew's religious journey. Our obscure lady had left the eminent and much published philosopher far behind, and it was because she was one of Christ's sheep. My sheep listen to my voice, I know them and they follow me. Our Lord in his public ministry and teaching does not extol as of supreme importance high intelligence and the best formal education. What is critical is faith in his person. It is the gift of faith which takes a person far beyond where mere reason can reach. But this is not simply the product of reasoning, and for all his reasoning, the gentlemanly Antony Flew did not get far. Fortunately, he got beyond his chosen atheism. What is fundamental is, in the first instance, belonging to Christ. What is necessary is the disposition or inclination of the will for him. One must be disposed for God and Jesus Christ. The pivotal issue is one's starting points, one's first principles, one's basic assumptions. They must be right and not wrong. One must be good soil for the seed to bear fruit. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. There we have it. You do not believe because you are not my sheep. To believe, we must be Christ's sheep. Let us then pray for the gift of a deep faith and the right starting points.